Yeah, thanks, Jovan. <clears throat> so my name's Miko. I'm currently a director at the Student Startup Center, a cool place on campus. Well, a cool place on the UC Davis campus, which is essentially a makerspace that provides not only technical resources such as 3D printers, a lazy laser cutter, a CNC, and more, but also we provide resources for you to jumpstart a business if you wish as a student. And this is our final MVP development webinar in which we have one of our sponsors, Hacker Lab, teaching this amazing workshop. So if Niall, if you could do a, a quick intro. Sure, yeah, hi. So my name is Niall. Um, sorry, I have a camera over here and then the people over here and then the rest of the stuff over here. So pardon my looking like I'm not looking directly at you. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm with Hacker Lab. Um, I'm actually a Davis grad too. Um, I graduated something like five or so years ago uh, with a CSE degree um, there. So I've been through that campus. Um, I grew up in Davis too, so I'm very familiar with the area. Uh, but Hacker Lab, I am the CTO, so I handle a lot of the technical stuff. Um, if you're not familiar with Hacker Lab, I can give a quick tour of our site. Um, we just were setting up a virtual tour, and so I was hoping I could grab that real quick and see if I could find the link to it, but it's still in development, so maybe not. Um, anyway, uh, so share. So here's our website. Um, the gist of it is we have this wonderful uh, maker space and co-working space um, with a whole bunch of different tools, equipment, that kind of stuff. Um, Sacramento. So if you were looking around, we have 3D printers. We have, think of us like a big different version of the Student Startup Center, uh, just kind of for everybody around the Sacramento area. We've got a full wood shop with, you know, CNC equipment, the CNC router, 3D printers, metalworking, welding, laser cutters, uh, just a general co-working space, uh, and all sorts of other stuff, photography lab, electronics lab. Um, and then we teach classes and all these things. The classes are like evening and weekend classes. The idea is you can come here, learn how to build something yourself, and then make it yourself. Um, so yeah, uh, we're a cool place. You should definitely come check it out once uh, the world starts opening back up again. Um, but yeah, uh, one of the classes that I teach there quite frequently is uh, an Arduino class. Um, and Arduino, I'm assuming you've all at least Googled it, um, but it's a wonderful uh, prototyping uh, platform for electronics. Um, you can make a lot of really cool stuff, a lot of really stupid stuff, a lot of really cheap stuff, um, and it's really lowered the bar for uh, for embedded programming and stuff. Uh, yeah, got it. So let's see if this works. I think I can give you a tour of the space. Yeah, so this is like if you walked into our building, this is what you'd see. A lot of this stuff here is actually made in-house. Um, so like the front desk was made here, that couch was actually made here. Sorry, I'm about up this. That, that chair was actually made here too, which is pretty cool. Um, if you go back here, you see we have offices that we rent out, lots of different startups and, and other uh, freelancer kind of folk hanging out there. Um, there is an alternative high school, uh, a small charter school based thing that exists over here. Um, oh, Don, I recognize you. Um, <laughs> and then we go back here, uh, got some cool new murals. Uh, go back here, we've got a whole shop. Um, also my face with Google eyes up there. Um, we've got, uh, let's go back here. There's a shop bot, CNC router, five by eight. We are Melande, they said this. No, that's, no. We don't What's care up? where you interviewed them. Uh, we, don't, we don't even need you or the word I in this anywhere unless there, there we go. All right, so somebody's got something else going on. I was trying to figure out whether that was a question or just random ranting. Um, anyway, uh, back, oh, I didn't want to go out that far. Like I said, this is still in development. Oh, I can't go this way, darn it. All right, well, there's a CNC router here too, so we can do milling, lots of prototyping and cool stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, just to kind of throw all that out there. Um, so, ooh, can I go in there? Yeah, I can, I've got green screen, photo studio, uh, I can't go into the electronics lab annoyingly, but that's fine. Um, anyway, so we've got all that fun stuff. Um, and so today I'm going to cover prototyping with Arduino um, from a very beginner standpoint. Um, just kind of, I'll go to the chat to figure this part out, but um, 
and I'll keep the chat open. Uh, sorry, I didn't have it open right there, but uh, I'll try to keep the chat open this whole time. Uh, I do have a couple monitors, so that's cool. Um, um, has everyone experiment? How many people have never actually touched an Arduino? I guess just say yes or no. Yes, yes, I have played around with Arduino. No, I have not played around with Arduino. And just put a yes or no in there so I can get an idea. Yes, cool. You got one yes, two yes, three yes, four no, five yes, six no. All right, cool. So um, of, of those people who said, yeah, actually of everybody, um, do you have any sort of programming experience? Uh, and that could be, that doesn't have to be like, oh, I'm in a CS program. Oh, I'm in, you know, whatever. It could be just, I've messed around with Python or I've messed around with C++ or I've done bash scripting, um, just so I can get a sense of where we're at there. Yes for I've done something with programming. No for I have never touched a line of code before. Yes, but not for a while, cool. Cool, okay, brilliant. So, oh, that, that seems good for now. So this class changes depending on who's showing up. Um, a lot of the simple parts of Arduino are really simple, but they don't make sense to somebody who's never touched electronics or hardware. Um, and some of the complicated parts are, don't make any sense if you haven't started at the basics. So what I, I do have a presentation and we'll be going through that kind of line by line, just covering each of the basics. Um, but once we get to the actual, I would call it hands-on, but I guess the did virtual hands-on part of it, um, part of the, the goal is to get you to try to do something on your own. Um, there's really no point in just sitting here and yelling at everyone. That said, if you have specific uh, Arduino questions, um, I do like to go off on tangents um, and I do like to go off on questions and keep it a little discussion friendly. Um, when I do this in person, usually there's a lot of discussion and a lot of feedback. Um, and so I'm totally open to that. Um, I'm even open to people talking, like you don't always have to ask them on chat if you don't want to, just be respectful about it. Um, I would rather have this a little bit more discussion friendly than just me lecturing or ranting. You have, you have, uh, you have lecture halls and classes for that. Uh, we're, we're a little bit more discussion focused. Um, so with that said, uh, we'll jump right in. Um, just a note, it's recorded. Yes, cool. Um, so let's see, just kind of background on Arduino, what it is. Um, Arduino is a small embedded computer, a uh, little microcontroller, an Atmel, Atmega328 for the most common Arduinos, um, running 16 megahertz, uh, two kilobytes of SR RAM, and one kilobyte of EEPROM like program and, and more permanent storage. Um, this picture is one of the this is, I think this is a picture of the actual first prototype Arduino that they got to, but it might be like a later model. Um, you can see it looks like it was milled uh, by like a small CNC router jig, um, not necessarily like a complete printed PCB. Um, I, I love the, the jumper wire just kind of wrapped around one of the pins there and then soldered to a, uh, a connector that might have been pulled out of some old computer or something. Um, the goal of Arduino in the beginning was to present a user-friendly platform for learning embedded programming and electronics. Um, there, Arduino was not the first programming, or, you know, microcontroller by a long shot, you know, um, and it wasn't even the first with a learning focus. Um, there were a few before it. One of the most common ones was uh, the basic stamp which is from a company called Parallax, which is actually up in Rockland. Um, they're still in business. They're wonderful people. The first first are like the prototype before becoming an Arduinos uh, were prototyped on their hardware. Um, but one of the issues was the boards were like $50 a pop. Um, whereas Arduinos, super cheap. Uh, you can usually find these things for under $10, under $5, if you're willing to wait a little bit longer and order them from abroad. Um, 
that is fantastic. Uh, we do a lot of teaching, not only with Hacker Lab community members, but with, you know, I do side work with other nonprofits where we teach STEM stuff in the community to kids. Um, and I really like Arduino because we can sit the kid down in front of a Linux box that's a refurb computer, probably that we bought from Maggie Surplus, um, and teach them on a free operating system with software that we downloaded for free on a platform that we paid you know, under $10 for. And so if a kid shows interest, we can just let them take it home themselves, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and it really, I really think it allows a lot of people to, to experiment in ways they might not have feel comfort, felt comfortable before. Um, plus it's super easy to use. It's got a USB, you plug it in, you program it. There's none of that setting up weird tool chains um, that exist with some of the other plat platforms out there. Um, so yeah, that's cool. Uh, this is the pinout of the Arduino, just to kind of get you a sense for what exists here. Um, it looks very, uh, it looks very daunting. Um, how did I do that? No, not that one. So if you can see, you can see my mouse, right? Somebody will tell me if you can't. Um, You'll see a bunch of pins on this side, and then on the right side, we'll call it, and then a bunch of pins on the left side. Um, go back to presentation. Those pins on the right are commonly referred to as the digital pins. Um, those are, you get generally two states with them. You can tell them to turn on, which means they apply positive voltage to whatever they're connected to, or you can turn them off, which means they apply no voltage, so ground, or whatever your ground reference is. Um, for those who don't, I guess one more question. Um, yes, for I have, no, for I haven't, uh, done any electronics stuff. And that could be, you under, I guess you understand what voltage is. That's usually a good analogy. Yes. If yes, I know what voltage is and kind of how it relates to current and resistance and no, I don't, I, I'm completely new to this electronics thing. I could throw that in the chat. Yes. Yes. Cool. Yes. We'll consider that good enough, everybody said. Oh no, one now, okay, cool. So the idea is uh, think about a the, the simplest circuit, which is a uh, flashlight. A uh, flashlight has effectively four components. You have a light bulb. Uh, we're not gonna use LEDs, we're just gonna use the old school. Uh, did anyone catch what the purpose of Arduino was? Oh, to build something, to prototype something. Um, so I have some stupid things. Uh, Here's a dumb little board that I designed. Uh, here, I'll stop share, show it here. Uh, so here is a little board with a bunch of LEDs on it, arranged in a seven segment display. And I also put my face on it and it's controlled with an Arduino. And I'll totally plug it in, but it's so bright that it kind of washes out the camera. Um, but if you look at it sideways, you can kind of see the LEDs. But this is me wanting to create a, uh, an alarm clock with really big digits. Um, and so I designed this board and plugged it into the Arduino and programmed it and that's cool. Um, another dumb one that I have is a uh, push to talk pedal for Discord. Um, so you can use an Arduino to remap some arbitrary keystrokes into a, uh, into a keyboard press. Um, so I press a button, it throws a, a keyboard command at my computer, which enables push to talk like a walkie talkie. So that if I'm playing games, I can use my foot to enable the talking instead of, uh, instead of having to press some weird key press. Um, some more serious ones, uh, I actually have the access control system at our downtown Hackalot facility running off a, I'll call it an Arduino derivative. It's a little bit beefier because um, it is running Linux on part of it. Um, and just to manage like the database and stuff, but it controls the door actuators, lets people in or out, that kind of stuff. Um, I've got an Arduino, I've got a couple Arduinos hooked up to different parts of my house for controlling uh, different buttons, a projector screen, lights. Um, if you can see behind me right, there is a 3D printer that is running off of an Arduino Mega or it's in being built. So it's an embedded controller. Um, Anything that you have that's a small device that has a little computer in it is effectively an embedded computer with something controlling it. Um, there's a range of 
devices out there, some that are smaller that do really fundamental, you know, rudimentary things, press a button, do this action, record temperature, send it somewhere, whatever. There are some that are a little bit beefier that are maybe showing a touch screen that are maybe more like a full-fledged computer with an operating system running and other fun stuff happening. So that's kind of the, the idea here. It, it gives you the ability to think of things that you'd like automated or interactions that you would like to happen or things that you would like to control through software um, and gives you a nice platform to try to do it yourself instead of waiting for uh, somebody else to build the thing. So yeah, hope that is a long-winded way to answer that question. Um, the gen one of the biggest issues I actually see in our Arduino class um, when people show up for it is they say, "Oh, what, what am I gonna? What should I build?" And uh, I don't really have the answer for that. Um, that's kind of your part of it. Uh, I can point you into, I can point you in a direction and say, like, "All right, here's a, you know, Thingiverse." or sorry, Instructables, Arduino projects, right? And I can say here, you want some inspiration? Uh, go here, look, lots of little things. Somebody's controlling a lucky cat. Somebody's uh, making their plant sing. I don't know how that works. Uh, a sound machine thing, an optical theremin. Look, you can build a theremin, a musical instrument. The, the options are down to what you can figure out to do. So uh, we'll figure out how to do. So. Uh, the the core of what I'm trying to get through today um, is teaching you the basics for how to control certain actions and how to read certain actions and how to interact with some basic electrical circuits. Um, I'm not going to give you some crazy project. Um, if you have a question on some particular device or something that you were trying to use, feel free to share that with me. Um, I'm not above pulling up a... Uh, a uh, uh, what do you call it, a data sheet and uh, trying to make heads or tails of it. Um, but most of the stuff I'm going to stick with now is very simple stuff. So um, with this Arduino, we have digital stuff. Uh, digital can be a button that's either off or on. Um, it can be a motor that's either running or not running. It can be a fancy LCD screen that you send data out to. It can be a whole series of buttons. It can be a bunch of other things that I'm not thinking of. Um, over on this left side, you see uh, the analog pins in the kind of bottom left corner. Those are connected to an ADC, um, an analog to digital converter. Um, and what that does is if you have a signal that's not flat zero or one, so um, it's every, if, I'm assuming everyone's familiar with generally what uh, that's annoying. I have to pull up the chat every time I go back to share screen. Um, are you things you shouldn't build with Arduino? Uh, yes. Uh, don't build anything that can hurt anybody because uh, that's not good. Um, I don't support that. Um, generally speaking, if you need an, the, the way I usually answer it is if you need an operating system uh, or think about whether you need an operating system or not. Uh, that's a good way of saying it. So, if what I'm doing is reading some piece of information like temperature or whether a button is pressed or the position of some knobs or, uh, you know, whatever, and just sending it someplace else or doing something quick with it, an Arduino is perfect. It's cheap. It's low cost. It'll help you out. Um, if what I'm doing is doing machine vision stuff remotely um, or doing trying to control a camera or drive a complicated touch screen that has more than just a couple buttons, or uh, do some heavy math, um, heavy as in more than just a little bit of, uh, you know, like if I, was, if I was thinking about doing this with large matrices in linear algebra, then Arduino is probably not for you or not for that task. Um, there are other options out there. Raspberry Pi is the big one. Um, Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi is a a single board computer. It's strangely about the same size as an Arduino. However, it is a full-fledged computer. You can hook up a monitor, uh, use an SD card as the hard drive, uh, hook up a keyboard and mouse, an ethernet port, and it looks like a regular computer. Um, it's a little bit more powerful, or I'm sorry, less powerful, um, but it'll work. Um, it's overkill for some situations. It's uh, not good enough for others, so just kind of Keep it in mind. 
usually uh, look at your, if you can do it with an Arduino, then that's probably a good solution. Um, if you can't figure out how to do it or you need a database or you need something heavier, uh, then leave Arduino and go elsewhere. Um, that said, there are different types of Arduinos and we'll go back to that pinout in the, uh, a little bit more. Um, so on this left side, you see the Pro Micro and the Leonardo. They're cool because they're slightly bigger processors. They have more RAM, they have more storage. Um, they're still relatively inexpensive. Um, I just got some Pro Micros, I think three for like $20 on Amazon. Um, they're cool though because they can do USB client uh, operations. So for like my foot pedal that I want to act like a keyboard, that's the one I went with because it had the ability to act like a USB human interface device. And the, I just plugged it into the computer. The computer didn't know that it wasn't a keyboard. Um, in the middle is an interesting one that's kind of on the newer end. It's an ESP32. It's awesome because it's still super cheap, like still under $10, um, but it has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on board. Um, and so you sometimes, ESP32 is really just this, just the chip that's underneath this cap. Um, this whole thing is uh, typically referred to as a node MCU, um, but it's completely Arduino compatible. You can use the same like coding language is the same IDE to program for it. You just have the, the pins are in different places. So you just have to pay attention to where those, those pins are. Um, and so that one is kind of my go-to favorite right now, just because I love being able to like a, a stupid, a wonderfully stupid uh, application is uh, at my house. I have a, uh, a Raspberry Pi that's, this is a Raspberry Pi and a few Arduinos. This can, this should only be accessible here. Uh, dang it, it's not showing up. I think I might be on a different VLAN right now. Sorry, can't see it here. All right, well anyway, um, I have a, oh, here, I can show it this way. Uh, I have a local server um, that is an Arduino that's running. Um, and what it can do is, uh, I have a web page. Um, I go to the web page. There's a couple different buttons. Uh, I can only get onto the web page if I'm on a specific part of my specific local network. Um, and when I go there, I see this. And it's got a bunch of buttons. I can go up or down. It's all really cool. I've got like a button for turning on the projector and turning off all the lights and all that stuff. Um, some of those integrations are really, really kludgy. Um, like for my projector screen, it's a projector screen that will go down or go up. I took the remote from the projector. I took it apart. I uh, soldered some wires to the button pads and then hooked those up to a relay and connected those to a node MCU. Um, and that was it. It took an afternoon to set it up and now I can push a button uh, and lower my projector screen, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah. ESP32s are awesome. Um, up here in the right-hand corner, this is kind of like Arduino's version of the Raspberry Pi. It's the UN. It has Linux on it. It is a full-fledged computer with a full-fledged operating system. In my opinion, it's a little bit weird, a little bit janky, but uh, it exists, so you should know about it. Um, down here is the weirdest one that I found. Um, it's really cool, though. Uh, it's an MKR VDOR 4000. It's actually produced by Arduino, um, but... Uh, when Intel bought out uh, Cypress, uh, or sorry, not Cypress, uh, Altera, um, they started putting FPGAs in weird places. Um, and Intel works with Arduino closely. They're not, uh, they're not the same company, but they are friends. Um, and so this one strangely has it. It's an Intel-based FPGA on an Arduino board with an ARM Cortex M0 microcontroller. And if you're a nerd or you're into microcontroller stuff, you, I think you, you get a sense for how weird that is. Um, but it is cool. Um, if you, FPGAs are frequently used in industry for doing really complicated machine control, um, they're becoming more useful as single purpose uh, uh, devices within computers or within servos. Um, FPGAs are kind of like a compromise between hardware and software. Um, the idea is you want some, it, ideally, if I had a computer that's sole purpose was to render uh, 4K video and literally nothing else, um, the fastest way to do that would be design hardware explicitly for doing that. 
Um, however, everyone wants their computers to be able to do other stuff too. So that doesn't make any sense. It'd be really expensive, whatever. Um, so instead you implement a lot of that in software and you maybe build some hardware like the graphics card for very specialty things. The FPGA is kind of like a middleman. Um, so you have some tasks that this computer is pretty much dedicated to doing over and over again. It needs to happen fast. It needs to happen very reliably. Um, you can throw it into an FPGA, which is like a reprogrammable circuit, kind of, um, and get speed boosts out of it there. So it's an interesting one. Um, yeah. To be fair, I have one and I haven't found a good use for it yet. So, uh, yeah. Um, normally, uh, with Arduino, uh, you program it with uh, the Arduino IDE. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. Um, if you want to download it, uh, arduino.cc, you'll be able to find it. Um, it looks like this here on the right. Um, there's, it's C++, really, um, with a different set of libraries. Technically, it's called wiring. Um, but the real biggest difference is you don't have the common things like C out and all the other standard library features. Instead, you have Arduino specific library features. Um, so for doing things like setting a pin high, you'd say digital write pin number and then high, right? And that's really cool because if anybody here has worked with uh, other microcontroller platforms, uh, sometimes they can get a little daunting um, and a little uh, convoluted. Um, a good one that I know you sometimes encounter at Davis is the MSP430 or some of the Cypress uh, controller or uh, microcontrollers out there where uh, in order to toggle a single pin high, you end up XORing like two bytes together to figure out what flags are controlling a internal pull-up resistor and what are setting, whether it's input or output or whatever. Um, so this Arduino, the goal is to that you take a hit in efficiency, in code efficiency, and in exchange for that, you get simplicity and readability. Um, so Arduino is a fantastic starting point uh, for prototyping. It's fantastic for one-offs and things that you want around your house. It's fantastic for hobbyists, proof of concept, startup, small business, that kind of stuff. It's not the best for, uh, I wouldn't use the Arduino platform as a whole in an end-use product that I was shipping out to somebody. Um, for that, you know, once you've got your proof of concept, when you're trying to refine it and get in into as small as a package as possible, that's when you want to consider diving into the full world of embedded where you're paying attention to exactly how much RAM you have and whatnot. Um, cause that's something to, you know, remember the Arduino has two kilobytes of RAM. Like we're not used to that these days. Uh, this computer that I'm on, what do I have? Uh, this PC, cool, uh, properties. Let's see what I got. Uh, here, you get my Windows product ID now. Um, this is 16 gigabytes, right? We're, we're talking about one or two kilobytes of RAM. You, you could barely hold a modern JPEG in that. Uh, so obviously certain things like that it's not good for. And that's been a thing with embedded devices for a long time. There are, uh, you, it's like regular computer programming, but with much tighter restrictions. You have to think about how you're using RAM. You have to think about how you're using storage. You have to think about how you're using your input and your output resources and your processor time. Um, because if not, you'll overload it. Um, and yeah, so I think that might speak back to things you should do. So back to this a little bit, um, controlling uh, the digital pins are the simplest, right? Um, so say I have my flashlight circuit, which I alluded to before. Um, my flashlight circuit is very simple. I have a light, I have a switch, I have a power source like a battery, um, and that's it. And when I turn the switch on, I connect the circuit current flows from the positive terminal of the battery to the negative terminal, unless you asked a physicist, and then it flows from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, but whatever. Um, and that flow of current, those electrons do work uh, and produce heat and light in the filament. Um, and it shines. And that's cool. And that happens as long as I have that positive end of the battery terminal at a higher voltage than the negative end. So if the battery, the battery gets old after a amount of time, all of a sudden it won't 
be producing a positive voltage anymore, or it won't be producing a voltage that's high enough. Um, and at that point, you will no longer see light. Um, or you can think of the switch doing that. You are attaching voltage to the positive or to the top side of the uh, of the L the light, or you're not. You can think of each of these digital pins like a switch that you can control with uh, software. So you can turn the switch on, and then whatever it's connected to will be receiving power from it. We'll see it at five volts. You can turn it off, and it'll be at ground at zero volts. Um, and with a couple of them, you can pulse really quickly, which by some devices gets seen as an intermediate value. It's called pulse width modulation. So that's how you do some kind of analog stuff. Um, and then you can also read in data that way too. Is a switch turned on or is a switch turned off? Is, uh, is there data being pulsed in kind of Morse code style through one of these pins? Those are all things that you can do with those digital pins. Um, and for those, of you, so going back to assuming that you know the difference between digital and analog, digital is, I can represent a picture, right? This picture that's on the screen um, in a couple different ways uh, through technology. Um, in the past, what they do, what you had is a, you know, an old uh, electron gun based uh, television that is constantly scanning data onto the screen and data is sent in a waveform. You have a continuous function. Um, if you have uh, the amplitude of your wave at, you know, some height, uh, you can represent any value between that. So uh, if I was running on a five volt system, um, this could be anywhere between zero and five volts. It could be zero, one, 1.1, 1.111, 1.0000001 1 volts, and all of those come out a little bit different. So a quick way to visualize that is uh, when you got interference on one of those older analog TVs, you, it usually represents itself as colors distorting, things kind of slightly moving out or getting wavy. Um, whereas with a lot of newer media forms, um, instead of that kind of just subtle distortion, what you see is either just the entire picture drops or you see pixels start popping up and doing weird things there. Um, that's because data is being sent digitally. Instead of sending a waveform, like an audio signal right through a wire where we're moving the wave up and down and in and out, um, we're sending a series of zeros or ones, zero, 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 or one, 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 right? Um, or one, zero, one, one. And the advantage there is that any, at any given point, that signal is either low, completely off, right, zero, or it's high, completely on. You don't have to worry about interference bumping the value of that, uh, of that signal slightly up or slightly down. It's either off or on. And it makes it a little bit more, I'm not going to say immune, a little bit more resistant to interference, um, which is a good thing for uh, a lot of our modern systems. But at the same time, you know, we can't just pipe audio straight into a speaker and have the, the same signal that's carrying the power actually move the speaker cone, right? We, we have to translate it back into, we have to translate it into the digital, do some processing on it and send it back out, convert it back to an analog signal or something approximating an analog signal. So that's, that's kind of digital analog. Uh, if anybody's confused on that, uh, feel free to speak up. <coughs> So um, with that said, we can move forward. Um, what we're gonna do, kind of, this is, if this is the usage, this is the socially distance usage slash I want to prototype uh, at home and I don't wanna get this hardware, I can't get this hardware or whatever. Um, realistically, all this stuff is fairly cheap and online and for under $10, you can probably build up, you know, everything that we're gonna do today and order it for yourself and you might have one in front of you. And if you do have this in front of you, you can totally follow along with it. Um, this is an, this is a digital represent or a, a computer representation of the or graphical representation of what we're doing uh, with the electronics. Um, so feel free to follow on there, um, or you can just follow along with Tinkercad. Um, so Tinkercad is a program put out by Autodesk. Um, it's uh, I put simulation in quotes and proto prototype. Um, for anybody who's in the electric, electronic, uh, electrical engineering or electronics or embedded sphere, um, I'm sure you've seen SPICE at some point. This is not SPICE. This is not doing component level simulation to that degree where you're describing electrical characteristics. Um, for that, you use SPICE <laughs> or, you know, model sim or 
one of those other things that are out there, um, or math. Um, but this allows you to prototype based on the most common Arduino components. Um, and that's kind of in line with what the goal of Arduino is. It's not, it's to kind of give you the ability to not have to get into the weeds on some of the more electrical engineering or computer engineering topics um, and still be able to create something very functional, very powerful, very cool. Um, so yeah, so uh, Tinkercad, it can cover most basic sensors and components. It can simulate some electrical characteristics. It's more like an accountant than a real simulator. That's more like an accountant than a physicist. So it'll tell you if you're putting too much power through something, or at least if it thinks you are, or if you're hooking two outputs up together and you have, you know, you're trying to drive, have two, two things drive the same line at the same time. And it's pretty smart about that. Um, and it can export to the Arduino IDE, so you can use this code and use this circuit base to build something um, later. What it cannot do is complex simulation and em emulation. Like I said, you need something like Spice for that. Um, custom libraries is a thing that really annoys me that it can't do. Um, you get one file per uh, project, which is really annoying. However, if you're into programming, you could always just dump your library code into the beginning of the project and use it that way. Uh, that is perfectly you know, viable. It's just you get a really long project that way. Um, you just, you're manually linking in all the libraries. Um, custom components it can't do. However, it's got a pretty good library of the common ones. Um, and it can't do PCB creation. Um, PCB creation is really fun. And uh, the more complex you get, uh, you know, why, why would I want a, a breadboard that looks like this that has a bunch of things sticking up and I can't remember what was going on and where uh, when I could, you know, send out for a PCB and this, I got 20 of these for $25 and they were here in six days. Like, that's awesome. We're, we're in the future as far as I'm concerned. And I was using free software to make that too, you know, it was KiCad. So, uh, I like to, you know, I, I don't, I typically go straight to breadboard, but occasionally I do use something like uh, Tinkercad or Fritzing is another similar one without the, the simulation um, to kind of draw it out. Um, if I'm just sketching it, you can think of that like a napkin. Uh, but then I either transition to like a soldered breadboard or just go straight to a PCB, do the design there, order it, um, just because I'm tired of doing really small finagly wiring. Um, yeah. So uh, for this, we'll be using Tinkercad, and so I'll switch over there. Um, just a quick one over on more into those inputs and outputs. Um, this is obviously a non-exhaustive list, uh, but can kind of give you a sense. Inputs, um, simple digital on-off. Those are like buttons or a line sensor, which is a one-dimensional camera. It tells you whether it sees dark or it sees light, um, and gives you a high or a low. Um, PIR sensors, uh, those are... Uh, uh, passive IR sensors um, can kind of do some motion detection and they'll give you a higher or low if they detect motion. Um, analog, these are continuous value. They have to go through the ADC. It's a potentiometer. A potentiometer is a knob. Um, any knob that you have that has a start and an end uh, is probably a potentiometer. It's a resistor that can vary its value. You find them everywhere. Uh, yeah. A thermistor, which is a small device that will change uh, its resistance with the temperature. And so you can use that to kind of measure temperature. Um, another one is a photodiode, um, which will, instead of it, think of it kind of like the opposite of an LED, it will uh, let current through based on whether it's uh, it sees light or not. Um, ask a physicist how that works, not me. Um, and then uh, complex things using a library. So that's like the ultrasonic range finder, which we can actually do without a library. Um, a fancy temperature sensor, uh, so like a TMP36 or an IR receiver. Um, you can think of it like a button you read by measuring as to whether it's on or off, right? Is the button pressed or is it not pressed? Um, with a more complicated library like a fancy temperature sensor, it's actually sending digital data over to you. Um, that is in some protocol that can be just serial 
which is on off on off on off it can be uh, something that has addresses that's a little bit more complicated um, like can or i squared c or can be spi which is just a fire hose of data um, think of that like uh, morse code you are tapping the signal onto a switch and that data is being sent uh, over the line. So it goes one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one. And then what that binary data means on the other end is up to your program. Um, or what the, you know, what the form of it being sent is, it's entirely up to your program. So yeah. Um, over on this other side, we have outputs. Um, simple digital outputs like uh, on and off, those are an LED or a relay. You can turn them on, you can turn them off about it. Um, with an LED, you can get a little bit fancier. Uh, it's analog, fake analogs, PWM, it's pulse width modulation. And that's where you pulse the, the digital pin so quickly that it acts like uh, it's not at full voltage or at zero voltage. And so you can control like the, the brightness of an LED. Um, or a DC motor uh, through something like a MOSFET. Um, or the really complex ones, which are other devices that you might need to control, um, like addressable LEDs. That's what I have in my little board. Each LED actually has a little microcontroller in it or a little circuit. It's not much of a microcontroller. And I can tell each LED what color I want it to be. Um, with servo, you can control the position through PWM. With screens, like little LCDs or OLEDs, you can pulse data to them and tell them what to display. So you can do screens on an Arduino. It's just a little bit more rudimentary. Um, so now, uh, one last thing before we jump right into starting with the uh, the um, the actual Tinkercad program. Um, but that is what a breadboard is. Uh, when I teach this in person, um, it depends very much on how familiar with electronics the attendees are, um, if they understand the concept of a complete circuit or not. Um, and the breadboard is really hard to teach with um, for somebody who doesn't know what a complete circuit is because you can't see the path, right? If I was using wires to build something, right? Like you can see these wires here and you know that power goes up through this one and then comes back out, you know, through this one. This is where current's flowing. If I wanted to make my, you know, light bulb uh, a circuit, I can grab a light and some alligator clip wires and make the circuit and show you what it means. With the breadboard, it's not as clear, um, but it's pretty simple. You just have to remember what's going on. So each of these little black holes, I can plug a wire into. Here is a, if you see, I'm sure you can see my, my screen somewhere on there. Uh, put this really close. Um, you can see here's a physical version of the breadboard and I have all these little wires sticking out of it. Each one of those wires can go into one of these little holes. Um, Underneath the breadboard, like if I were to rip the back off of one of these and destroy it, um, all of these holes that are in one of these blue rectangles are connected. So if I wanted to connect two components together, I can put the leg of one of them in one of those holes and then the one right next to it or the one next to it, and it's all good. Um, on this side here, same thing, but in these horizontal rows, um, everything along this black bar is connected to itself to each other and everything along this red bar is connected to each other um, This lower black bar is not connected to this upper black bar um, Unless you connect them you can always run a wire between the two of them and that's totally fine um, and each one of these rows that is connected uh, is broken across this center channel so just a little bit of terminology um, you'll see me refer to these, the red plus and the black minus ones as the power and the ground rail. The ground rail is the, the ones that holds along the black line. The power rail is the ones along the red line. Um, and then the center gap I refer to as the IC channel um, because it's perfect with to put a little integrated circuit across. Um, I think I can show you there. There's a little circuit that's kind of straddling the gap in the middle there. Um, so that's what that's what it's there for. Um, so yeah, and now we can jump right in. Um, we always start with something very simple. This is actually, we're gonna go one back, just an LED first. Um, so I'm gonna switch over to Tinkercad now. Um, and I encourage you greatly to follow along because I really don't think like not 
you know, I, I don't think you learn much if you're not actually here doing this um, and trying to remember what I said after the fact. I mean, I guess I'll be on YouTube, but uh, it's not as good after the fact, in my opinion, trying to remember. Um, so if you go to Tinkercad and you log in, um, if you have to create an account, cool, create an account. Um, you'll notice on the left here, you get 3D designs, circuits, code blocks, lessons, all that kind of stuff. So lessons are a bunch of like pre-made tutorials if you want to get into those cool. 3D designs, it actually has a whole CAD system here so you can build stuff if you want. But circuits is where we're going to be. Um, and I'm going to create a new circuit. And it's default names are some of my favorites, just Fantabulous Blad, that's a default name. Uh, this is a real name. Uh, this one is another default name, so it's just going to give you an arbitrary name. But if I create a new circuit, I'll get thrown over to this screen um, where I have all of the stuff. Um, the general is this middle zone is kind of my uh, workspace. On the right here, I have lists of components. Um, by default, it goes to basic, but I switched to all pretty quick. So we can look at all of the different things excuse me, that exist here. NeoPixels, common LEDs, motors, uh, servos, hobby gear motors, and remote control, seven segment display, all sorts of other fun stuff. Um, so yeah, sorry, um, that was going crazy and I'm, I don't want it there anymore. Um, so you can, uh, this, this is the wrong window, sorry about that. There we go. So if I wanted to add a component to this left side, um, I would find it over here. And the two things I almost always start with are a breadboard and an Arduino. So I'm going to find the breadboard. I'm going to use the small one. Actually, we use the large. No, I'll use the small one. I'll drag it over here, and it's massive. So I'm going to zoom out. And I can give it a name if I want, but I don't really want to. So I'm not going to give it a name. Well, that's cool. And then I'm going to grab an Arduino and bring it over here. And Shazam, I've got an Arduino and I've got a breadboard. And you'll notice when I'm hovering over things, it's starting to light up. Uh, I can wire things together digitally. So if I want to wire, say, uh, the first thing I normally do is I want to connect this power rail to my five volt source, five volts from the Arduino. And uh, oh, word of warning, um, this is less for when we're doing computer zone and more for when we decide we want to uh, build this for real. Um, this Arduino is plugged, I'm getting power from USB right now. Uh, and that USB in this case is coming from my monitor's USB hub. Uh, so the USB 2.0 spec is really only supposed to uh, guarantee 500 milliamps, which is half of an amp, which is not a lot. Um, most modern USB ports go much higher than that, and the USB 3.0s that you're using to power all your phones are much more than that. Um, so it is totally possible to draw way too much power out of your computer. Um, this is probably only going to be an issue if you start running a very large number of lights, uh, and it's usually not going to hurt the computer. It's just going to shut down your Arduino, um, or it'll burn out the Arduino first. Um, but in a couple situations where you are trying to drive really large inductive loads like motors or other weird things, this could be a problem. Um, so typically when I am trying to control high power devices, like really high power devices, um, <laughs> I either use a junk laptop or I do the programming and then I switch to another power uh, source before I uh, start running the heavy devices. You'll notice right down here, um, I have a USB cable right here, and then I have a, another barrel jack connector down here. Um, the Arduino, the physical one, has one of those too. Um, and you can plug a random power adapter that outputs between 7 and 12 volts into that. Really, 7 and 13, and you're fine. Um, and I'm going to grab a random power adapter that I have just next to my computer. Cool. So this is why I keep old power adapters. Uh, typically referred to as wall warts because they look like warts when they're hanging off the wall. Um, and this is from, I have no idea what it's from. It's a high pro brand. 
Um, if I look on here very closely, I can see that the output is listed at 12 volts at 4.16 amps. So I know that if I plug this into the Arduino, I'll be able to handle it. The Arduino can run off of it. And uh, I can draw up to 4.16 amps, which is cool. I can control some serious stuff with that. Um, not so much. Uh, also, the Arduino GPIOs aren't designed for, we'll, we'll get into that later, heavy, heavy power usage. You got to go through something else. So back to here to my Arduino. So I want to hook up power to the 5 volt. So what I'm going to do is click, and you don't have to click and hold, but I'm going to click on the 5 volt pin right here, and it starts a wire. And I don't want to just go straight over because that's going to get really messy. So I'm going to kind of route it. <clears throat> so everywhere I click, I get a little bend. And notice it kind of snaps to your horizontal and verticals. And then I'm going to go to this. Cool. And then when you're done, it gives you the option. I'm going to make it red so that you know that it's power. And I'm going to straighten it out a little bit. Lock in. Wow. Come on. Come on. All right, cool. I should note that I'm not normally a Windows user. I'm more Linux-based, so this computer is a little bit weird to me right now. This is a CAD computer that I keep in the back room for stuff. So yeah, anyway. Um, so yeah, now I've connected power. And then if I wanted to do ground, uh, the negative rail here to ground, just so I have power up here, I can do a similar thing. I'll go here, there, there. There and there. And I'm going to make it black just to match that. <clears throat> and so now, this power rail, all of these pins on here are 5 volts. They're hooked up to the 5 volts. And remember, this 5 volts, it's actually the 5 volt from your USB, from your computer, but uh, that's OK. Um, in if it was a real uh, Arduino. Um, and then ground is the ground reference. So now I can use power and ground here on my breadboard when I'm prototyping something. Everything there makes sense? Cool, I'll assume yes. Um, all right, so now we're gonna do the hello world for Arduino that everyone does blink because that's where we have to start. And if I don't start there, even if 90% uh, of you will uh, be there, there will be one person who doesn't know what's going on. And it's also usually a great way to prove that your Arduino can communicate to your computer uh, when you're doing this for real. So in the top right corner here of the Tinkercad uh, page, um, you'll notice a couple buttons. One is code. Code is what we're going to use. Uh, another one is start simulation. If I click that, you'll notice the USB plugs in and it does something. You can see that this little light turns on and some other things happen. Uh, that's how you run your simulation. Uh, export will just download it uh, so you can have an offline coffee and share as if I wanted to share this with you. Um, so I'm going to go to code and this little code window will open. By default, it opens with this block editor. Um, which is cool if you want to program that way, but uh, I find it really annoying uh, and I don't like it. So we're not going to use it. Uh, here where it says blocks, I'm going to go to text. Uh, and it says, are you sure? And I say yes, because I'm cool. Um, I'm also going to delete some stuff just for explanation. So um, for those of you who have used C or C++, um, you're probably familiar with int main, right? Int main, that's my function which I put everything in, in C and C++. Um, do you have to do it that way? No, but good luck. Um, if you want the rest of your operating system to be able to figure out where the entry point is, um, Good luck. You technically don't have to, uh, but it's really es why is esoteric and I don't understand it completely. Um, but anyway, in Arduino, instead of that, you have these two functions. And these are functions. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger while we're coding. And then when we go back to the, uh, to the wiring stuff, then I can, uh, oh, actually, 
that's kind of cool. This will work a little bit. Um, anyway, I have two main functions. I have setup and I have loop. Code that I put in setup, i.e. code that I put here, when the Arduino starts, that will be executed once and only once, just at the beginning. Uh, it will happen again if I cut power and restore power to the Arduino, or if I hit the reset button on the, on the Arduino, but it's meant to be your setup code that is only happening once. Underneath that is the loop. Uh, with loop, it happens over and over again, endlessly. So if I had a uh, do thing A, do thing B, do thing C, right? Uh, and do super cool thing. When I started this program, when I ran it, uh, the first thing that would happen is super cool thing, then thing A, then thing B, then thing C, then thing A, then thing B, then thing C, then A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, you get the idea. This would just keep going in order over and over again. So setup is for like configuration. I need to set up what pins I'm using that stuff, but we only have to do that once. Loop is the thing that's happening over and over again. That makes sense? If it doesn't, I'll assume somebody drops some info in the chat that says, hey, can you elaborate on this? Like I said, if something, you know, feel free to make requests, move faster, move slower. I'm okay with that. Um, I might not listen, but please uh, feel free to share. Um, so the bare minimum sketch is this. Uh, these two slashes in front of some text mean that this is a comment, uh, just like in C and C++, um, which means this is not code. This is a note to self. Uh, so if I wrote some code and I can't remember, or I think that tomorrow, I'm not going to remember what it was, I can write an explanation about it here. If I wanted to do a longer note, I could do that. And then everything between these two, just gibberish, is now a comment. Cool? Cool. All right, so that's fantastic. Um, let's actually do something. So the first thing we're going to do, first thing that everyone does is blink an LED. We're going to turn an LED on, then we're going to wait, then we're going to turn an LED off. It's simple. So first thing I need to do is uh, declare uh, what set up the LED that I want to use um, or the pin that I want to use. And we haven't really connected much to this yet. So we're going to start out by using the built-in LED which is right here, it's this L, it's, it's, and it's hooked up to pin number 13. So whatever's happening on pin number 13 will happen on this LED too. So first we're gonna set the pin mode. So what is this doing? This is saying, I want GPIO, a GPIO is a pin, general purpose input output number 13 to be set up as an output. Yes, what, what they said, um, to be set up as an output. Um, so uh, I say pin mode 13 output. Cool, uh, that's all I need to do there. Next, in the loop, I wanna say digital write, I will turn it on, delay for 1,000 milliseconds. Turn it off, turn it low, and then delay for another 1,000 seconds or 1,000 milliseconds. If I didn't have these delays, these two lines, 13 high and 13 low, will be executed as quickly as possible. Um, I think each one of those when it's compiles expands to maybe like 
four or five uh, operations. So that's four or five clock cycles at 16 megahertz. That's pretty quick. Um, it's too quick to see. Um, so you actually don't get any effect there. Um, or it doesn't look like you get an, get an effect. It's just way too fast. Um, so I get delay. And delay is pretty much just do nothing for a bunch of clock cycles. Um, delay is a little bit fat, fancier than that uh, internally. I think it's using interrupts for it. But uh, yeah. Um, so 13 high, 13 low. Cool. And so now I have this code where I'm ready to try it. Uh, so I'm going to simulate. Um, if I made a problem in the code, I'm going to add a typo just to see what happens. Um, it'll yell at me here. It'll say, hey, uh, your code has some errors. And if I increase this, zoom in on this. In function void loop on uh, line 12, uh, G was not declared in this scope. Um, much like other compilers that you may have used, it's cryptic. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's AVR GCC, so it's, uh, it, it does sound like C++ compiler uh, yellings and errors. Um, so what's going on here? I've just got this G right here, uh, so I'm going to get rid of that. Um, just like C, for those of you who are not familiar with C or C++, uh, I must terminate all of my lines with this semicolon. Um, and for each closed curly brace, I need an open curly brace for each open parentheses, I need to close parentheses and all that good stuff. So pin mode 13 output, digital write 13 high, delay 1000, digital write 13 low, delay for 1000. Let's try this again. Cool. And if I look very closely right here, that LED is blinking or it's simulated blinking. Yay, that's hello world, it's very simple. Um, if I wanted to do this with a physical Arduino, I could. Um, oh, snap, is Arduino not on this computer? Arduino is not on this computer, I am sorry. Uh, is anybody, actually, I guess we'll, we'll do it this way. Um, is anybody out there following along with a physical Arduino, just so I figure out whether I should bother showing this? Uh, say yes in the chat if you are, uh, otherwise I'll say no, nobody is. All right, cool. I'll assume that nobody is. Um, you should give money to them. They're awesome. Um, but right now I'm not giving money to them. Uh, let's see how fast I can install the Arduino IDE. Real time. This should go quick. It's a pretty beefy computer. Well, that's happening. So that's cool. All right, we have a blinking LED. Now we want to add a wired LED to this, like a physical LED, uh, or at least an analog, you know, a, a computer representation of it. Uh, do, do, do. Still not done yet. Show me details. All right, so uh, I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna close the code window. And then on the right side over here, I'm gonna look for an LED. You can search here and find it faster if you want, but there's not so many that it's impossible to scroll. I'm gonna drag an LED over and I can change its color if I want, I'll make it green. I didn't want yellow, I wanted green. That's cool. And then I'm gonna put this someplace on the breadboard. We'll put it right here. Notice how I put this leg of the LED here and this leg of the LED either here. Yes, you did notice that, brilliant. All right, so next I need to add a resistor because this is kind of a simulation. Um, these GPIO pins, the Arduino pins, they run at five volt logic. So they will be putting five volts on when you set them to high. Um, that means, if I look back at my code, when I say digital write 13 high, I'm saying this pin right here, pin 13, I want you to set that to five volts. And when I say digital write 13 low, I'm saying I want you to set this to ground, to zero. All right, I could also use true or false or one or zero and it'd be the same thing. High is just another way of saying true or one. No, 
No, there was a no. What was the no for? You got to remind me. No, oh, no is in no Arduino. Okay, cool. Um, no physical Arduino, thank you. Um, that's cool. Uh, I want. I feel like I have to prove this anyway. So in the physical Arduino, yes, you can, you can have access. Uh, it's actually, yeah, it's written in Java. Uh, I'm gonna just open the blink code, or actually we'll just copy this whole thing. Copy, paste, tools, board, Arduino Uno, port. Uh, ooh, let's see what it is. One, four, five, six, four. All right, so I'm gonna send this code over. Yes, I'll save it. And look, the LED is in a different place on this board, but it is also blinking. So I got the same code, copy and paste, and it works here too. That, yes, proof. All right, so enough of that. All right, so this Arduino, I wanna hook it up. Um, and uh, these pins, the GPIOs are running at five volts. Um, however, this LED wants to run closer to like two volts or 2.2. If I just hooked it up directly, like so. Just to see what's gonna happen. And then let's run the simulation. It gives me this little warning here. And when I hover over it, oh yeah, okay. So that's one thing I don't like about it. It only gives you the warnings very sporadically. Um, I guess if I don't ever turn it off, I'll get it to stay. So notice it gave me a little warning when I turned it on. It says current through the LED is 52.3 milliamps while recommended maximum is 20 milliamp. The usable lifetime of the LED may be reduced. Um, by that they're saying we don't know when this LED is gonna blow up, but it might. And sometimes if you put too much current through these LEDs, they will. Um, LEDs and diodes suffer from uh, runaway, uh, run away something, I can't remember, but they allow more and more and more current and start to act more and more and more like a short, the more current you give them. Um, and so they will explode. Um, it's really fun to do. Um, it doesn't hurt and uh, it's always fun to show off, but yeah. So in order to lower that amount of current running through it, we need a resistor. So let's grab a resistor. I'm gonna go stop the simulation going to first get rid of this comment that I added there and go back to close the code window. Let's grab a resistor. I'm going to set its value to 330 ohms. And Niall, why 330 ohms? Uh, in any Ohm's law. You all said you were familiar with Ohm's law. Ohm's law. Um, I want to have the voltage, if I have a circuit going from 13 through the resistor, through the LED, back down to ground, some amount of that voltage is going to be dropped across the resistor. Some amount of it is going to be dropped across the LED. I want two across the LED. I want 330 across the resistor at 20 milliamps. That means that 330 is the value that I want to use. Um, if you want to get into the math on that, have fun. Technically, I know an LED is non-ohmic for anybody who's in the weeds on that, but you can, if you know what it wants to behave like, you can model it like one. Um, for those of you who uh, are really lazy down the line and want LEDs, uh, LED resistor color, or resistor calculator. Uh, Google that, go to the one at DigiKey, <clears throat> or actually, sorry, that's not the one I wanted. Uh, LED series parallel calculator is an awesome one. Um, honestly, if all I'm doing is just quickly trying to figure out how I want LEDs, I have five volts, 
I have the diode forward voltage of 20 milliamps, uh, or sorry, two, two volts, 20 milliamps for the current and number of LEDs for, uh, it'll design me a stupid little array that says, hey, get these resistors, put them in this order, um, and you'll be cool. And that's cool, uh, yeah, so. Uh, or you could do the math or just kind of follow along. Um, so I'm going to use 330. Move that wire, delete that wire for now. Grab this. The rotate button is in the top left corner here. Rotate it sideways. Cool. So now it's going from this column to this column. So I'm going to go from here to pin number 13. Brilliant. So now going over to my code just to check to make sure it's right. Brilliant. Notice that both LEDs are blinking. Yay. So uh, pin 13 is what I do there, corresponds with what I do here. Uh, if I wanted to control more of them, I could. Let's just really quickly make something kind of silly. Move this over here, rotate it. Move this up here. Cool. Uh, control C and Control V work. All right, so now I have two LEDs and I want to watch them uh, I want to make a siren. Uh, so sure you can try to figure this out on your own, but uh, we'll just jump right into it. Um, digital right help. I first I need another GPIO. Um, so I hooked this up to 12. So I'm going to declare that one. Uh, All right. And then digital right 12 low. All right, so now when 13 is high, 12 is low. When 12 is low, 13 is high. And so the defired effect should be flashing, strobing, that kind of stuff. Let's see if that works. And it doesn't, what did I forget? Oh, I forgot to hook this part up to ground. That's what I forgot. Let's try it again. So yay, now I have this. Cool, and if I wanted to increase the speed of its flashing, I could decrease the delay time. 500, half a second. And now it's flashing faster. Uh, but let's say I wanted to control that, uh, that blinking speed with a knob um, because my device, my little siren thing, I need to have adjustable uh, blinking speed. That's a feature that must exist. Uh, okay, cool. So now we need an input. We need a way to control that. Um, we're going to use a potentiometer here. Um, so let's go leave the code and go back over to this. Um, you'll hear me refer to these as pots. Um, a potentiometer, it's commonly called a pot. Um, so yeah, I'll put this here. And a potentiometer has three pins. It has a wiper, 
has a one terminal and another terminal. Um, so what happens is the resistance across the entire device from terminal one to terminal two is always the maximum of that potentiometer. So if I have a 250 kilo ohm potentiometer, which I have right here, the resistance from here to here will always be 250 kilo ohms. The wiper will have a different resistance depending on how you move the knob. If I move it all the way to the left, then the resistance from the wiper to this left terminal will be zero, and from here to the right terminal will be 250. If I move the knob to center, oh, I can't turn it until I'm in simulation mode. All right, we'll go into simulation mode. I can turn it to center, then it's gonna be split, half of 100 and 125 between these two, and 125 between these two. All right, you get the idea, it moves, it moves a center wiper along a different position in this resistor so that you get a different effective resistance in this center uh, pin. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, I'll assume somebody says no. All right, so I want to wire this up. Um, in order to wire this up, uh, because this is a device that's changing its resistance uh, depending on what, uh, what value you give it? Can I add a node on this? No, I can't, it's annoying. Um, because it's changing its resistance and not just a flat off or on, this is an analog device and we need to use a, the ADC to read it. Um, so we're going to set it up. First, we're gonna connect the, one of the terminals to ground. Then we're gonna connect another, the other far terminal to power, sorry to five volts. And then the last one, we're gonna to connect to the AD, one of the ADC pins, the analog pins over here. And I'm actually going to make this much cleaner. Oh, that can just be that, yeah. Oh, I will make this one red, this one black, this one yellow. Cool, so. Now I have more wires, yay. So I have three connected up to this pin um, and here is a potentiometer, a uh, real one, it's a tiny one. Uh, it has the three pins on the bottom for each one of those three pins. Um, there's lots of different types of them, bigger ones, smaller ones. Uh, if you ever are about to throw out a piece of electronics that uh, has a really nice knob on it and you want to keep that, feel free to tear it apart and desolder that and then you can use it, it's kind of cool. Um, anyway, so now I have this knob. Brilliant, what can I do with it? Well, I need to sense what that value is in the middle. Um, so let's go back over to code. Um, and these analog pins are always input, so you don't need to worry about configuring them. Um, you can just read from them. So first thing I need to do is create a variable to store that information. Um, I'm gonna use an integer. I'm gonna call it value because I'm super creative. And I'm gonna set it equal to analog read and then the pin, A0. And then what I'm gonna, I'm gonna do with it, I'm gonna set the delay based on this value. So that number, it's gonna give you a scaled value between zero and 1,024. Um, so if I have the knob all the way to the left, uh, or maybe the right, I can't remember, we'll find out. Um, it'll give me zero, and if I have it all the way to the other side, it'll give me 1,024, and if it's somewhere in the middle, it'll be somewhere in the middle. Um, what you do with that number is up to you. Here, I'm turning that into the blinking speed. 
So let's start this simulation pool. And so up here, I have these LEDs. And I'm going to increase this. And notice it's blinking much more slowly. Let's speed it up. Notice how it is really fast and it gets slower as I rotate around until we're all the way on slow. One second. So that's cool. Yay. And let's say I wanted to increase that range between zero and two seconds. Um, I could just scale it over here. I can throw a value in here. I could say two times. And then down here, I could say two times. And so now the longest one is a full two seconds. The middle is about one second. And we slow down intermittently. But you get the idea. I'm not controlling that speed directly through some kind of timer or weird thing. I'm just using the microcontroller to do it. It makes doing things like this really easy. If I wanted to set up a bunch of these, I could. Um, with the default pins, that means I can have up to six of them. Um, and then I could have a bunch of LEDs. But you can, through electrical tricks, turn this into a lot more if you want it. All right, so that's that's that basic part. Um, does anybody have any questions so far? Now might be a good time to, to pause for uh, questions or something in particular you were trying to do, um, else I've got more things we can just keep going. Uh, feel free to throw them in the chat, and then if you want to have a discussion, we can talk. But uh, yeah. Cool, I'll take that as everyone's good. Um, okay, I guess I'll give it a couple more minutes if you're answering a, asking a question, a fancy one. Um, oh, are all potentiometers between 0 and 1,024? Good question. No. Um, the potentio There's two different things going on here. One is the, the value of the potentiometer, um, which is the resistance that it is. Um, the resistance is going to be based on what potentiometer you've bought. So I have a little one here. Uh, ooh, can I do this? I think I can do this. Let's unplug this, plug this in. Cool, so I think I should be able to capture this. So this is going to be a close-up of that potentiometer when they can get it focused. And not super shiny. So you see that one zero three. That's times ten to the third. Um, so this is a ten k ohm potentiometer. Um, I think that's right. It, it's either a ten or a one k. No, it's a ten k. Um, so this uh, is this a one k? No, this is a ten k. I'm pretty sure this is a ten k. I can never remember how they do the markings exactly. Uh, but one zero three, I'm pretty sure means ten k or uh, it's 10 and then times 10 to the third. Um, so this is a, a 10 kilo ohm potentiometer. Um, and so that means the resistance of it, if I measured across the outer terminals, uh, would actually be uh, 10 K, 10,000 ohms, no matter what. Um, what changes is this middle devices, this middle uh, pins resistance between these two. Now this 1024, where that's coming from is 
when I read the value here, I am using Ohm's law across this resistor to get a different voltage at this middle point. You can think of it like, uh, here we go. Think of it like I have a strip of resistor and I have a contact at one end and let's see, can I do whiteboard? Here is the whiteboard. Stop share. Let's do a. I can't do whiteboard in this one. That's annoying. All right, that's fine. All right, we don't need a whiteboard because we have MS Paint. All right, so. Uh, I ha let's say I have a strip of material that's resistive, and at one end I have a positive lead, and at the other end I have a ground lead. Um, what I'm doing is taking a third lead right here, and we're going to make it fatter. And we're going to select, and then we're going to select it. All right. And so what I'm doing is, when I, I, I assume I have current coming in through here and then flowing out through here. So my current is going that way. Cur oh, I cannot do that. I cannot draw. Wow. All right. So I have current flowing that way, um, and uh, there's a total resistance across this entire sheet, right? And there is a resistance per unit distance going on here. So if you uh, touch this middle lead closer to this, to the negative terminal, the resistance from here to down here is going to be low. If I increase it, the resistance between here is low, but now the resistance between these two, or sorry, is higher. Now the resistance between these two is low. And so for, you can think of it like a fractional thing. The Arduino is always reading the voltage at this point, determined by this resistance and where I'm touching, uh, between the low voltage and the high voltage. In the Arduino, that's zero and five volts, but it might as well be zero and 3.3 volts. This is just a fractional distance. You can think of it like if I'm right in the middle, that means I'm at 512 out of 10, 1,024. Uh, it's a fraction. So it doesn't actually tell you what the voltage is. It just tells you what it is proportional to what this high point is. Does that make sense? So it will, for any resistive device that you're measuring, right? And a there's a wide variety of resistive devices out there. Um, one is a thermistor. And we'll go to images for that. And you can see all of these little devices. You see them in 3D printers or in other devices that do heating or cooling and need to pay attention to the temperature. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the resistance across these two pins will change depending on how warm this top part is. So when this gets warm, uh, this will lower down closer to zero. And when it gets really hot, it'll raise up closer to 1024. Um, another option is a uh, flex sensor which are these cool little things. Um, you'll see people do this kind of thing um, and then put them into gloves, um, and, you know, on the back hand of your hand in a glove. And then you can kind of approx, how prime the, yes, exactly. Yes, 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 yes. That's exactly right. It, uh, you have a, what's uh, two to the, what is 1024. That's how much, how many bits of resist or of, uh, of, uh, this, I, yes, you get the idea. Um, that's how, how much resolution you get uh, on your ADC. Um, if you want a higher precision ADC, like for doing something along with sound or something, um, you can get uh, external ADCs. So I squared C ADC. This will probably... So here's an Adafruit one. Um, this is a gain amplifier so it's a how many bits is it 
I don't know, it's not telling me, but you can open up the data sheet and find out. Oh, that's their board. So what's the actual device on it? ADS-115? ADS-1015. ADS-1015. Show me a data sheet. It's a lot of things, but it's probably also an ADC. Anyway, there is an ADC in it. So it's a 12-bit ADC. It probably gives you a much finer grained uh, 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 readout of what you're measuring then. And so for something like this, you know, where you're trying to build something, you can prototype with a random junk resistor, right? You know that your code is going to respond between 0 and 2024 based on what this value is. So you could prototype here and then decide that you want to use a fancier ADC or something else. Um, those really fancy ADCs actually uh, communicate using a different protocol. Um, but, you know, you'll still, get, you'll still be getting some kind of ratio, right? So those are uh, flex sensors or another one. It's going to give you a number between 0 and 24. So if you wanted to control something with a glove, Make your own power glove, that's fantastic. Um, there are a lot of other resistive devices. Um, an interesting one that I see a lot in our space, soil moisture sensors. So it's these little devices and they're measuring conductivity and so they'll give you a value based on the resist. You stick these in the ground and you can tell whether the soil is damp. Uh, if you wanna set up some kind of like automated aquaponics or uh, it's not so much aquaponics, but uh, like, m you know, monitor your garden with an Arduino. Uh, you can do that here or a potted plant and figure out whether it's happy. Um, these are kind of the, these standard ones are the PCB ones are the low end versions. You can get really, really, really fancy ones um, out there. But uh, yeah. And it's kind of like, you know, I, I say the same thing with tools. Uh, if you don't know how long you're going to need it for, uh, get the cheapo Harbor Freight version um, and for, you know, pennies. Um, and then if you break it because you used it enough, that's when you start to look into the nicer ones. Um, the, you know, the price range for these is going to be down to AliExpress probably has those cheap ones for under a quarter a piece or maybe 50 cents a piece. Uh, the super nice lab grade, I'm measuring the conductivity between these two probes. You're probably looking at, you know, 50 plus dollars for the low end of the, the lab grade ones and then probably a couple hundred for the really nice ones. Um, so yeah. And that's, a, that's another thing, feel free to ask. If you, there's a particular application, like I am trying to measure this or I am trying to control this, feel free to dump that into the chat and uh, we can try to build up a circuit based on that. Um, I'm totally down with that because that would be kind of fun. Um, just, you know, kind of let me know what it is that you're trying to control or build or something and I can point you in the right direction. All right, so now I have a potentiometer controlling this. Cool. Uh, let's say I wanted to use this potentiometer to control like a servo. Uh, so that's a little positional motor. Um, I'm still watching the chat, so if somebody drops something in, feel free. Um, all right, let's go back over here and let's try to find a servo. Do, do, do. Servo. Oh, look, it even has a starter with it already wired in. Cool, I'm going to delete this part of it. Whoa. Yes. Oh, what? That was dumb. All right. We're going to use a micro servo. Cool. So it's a little servo. Um, do I have one of these handy? I think I've got one right here. So hold on one second. Uh, you know what? That's buried too far in my pile of stuff. Uh, anyway, uh, I'll, this picture is not super representative. Uh, so let me do the old uh, micro servo. Give you a sense for what it looks like there. Um, 
those are these little devices, right? Uh, you attach these little uh, these little bars to the top of it here, and then you can control its position. Um, if there are three kinds of super common motors that you use in electronics robotics, the first is just a straight DC motor. Um, when you apply power to it, it spins. Um, when you give it more current, it spins more. When you give it less current, it spins less. Simple. Uh, next, you have the positional servo, which or you have a servo, which is more, I want to control exactly where this is. Like if you imagine uh, this top down view is like a protractor. That's the right thing, right? A protractor. Uh, I can say go to 60 degrees. I can say go to 90 degrees, go to 120 degrees. And you see them on like remote control airplanes a lot, uh, more powerful ones controlling valves, weird stuff like that. Um, so that's the second option of motor. The third option is a stepper motor. Um, those you see on like CNC equipment, other controllers, they will continuously turn, um, but they will turn by a known distance. So you can say, I want to step forward uh, five units. Uh, cool, step forward five steps. So here's a stepper motor, give you a sense for what those look like. It's the same idea. Um, if you twist them, you can feel that they have some little detents in them. Um, and so you can control how much they rotate. So yeah, and those are depending on your application, right? You think about what kind of device you need to control and that will let you know what kind of uh, motor you need. Um, so with this, um, I'm gonna hook this servo up. So it tells me, actually I'm gonna put it over here and I'm gonna rotate it. All right, so it tells me that's power. So I'll connect that to five volts and I'm gonna make it this just for my sanity. Um, and then we're gonna do ground, which is this one right here. Cool. And we're gonna make that black. All right, and then we need to control the servo. Um, for the servos, um, because you're controlling, it, it, there's no fancy digital controller in this. You're actually using PWM to control where the position is. Um, so you'll notice on the Arduino, come on, zoom in, um, there are these little, squiggly lines next to some of the numbers. Um, those are uh, indicators that that pin is hooked up to PWM, and so you can pulse width modulate it and control something like the dimness of an LED or the speed of a motor or the position of a ser servo. Um, yeah, so... Doo -doo 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 -doo. And we're not going to uh, do anything fancy with the servo. Um, we're just gonna try to control its position. So uh, we need to hook this one up to another pin. Um, I'm gonna use pin number 11 since it's right there. Oh, too far. And just to make this stand out, we'll make it turquoise. All right, cool. So now I have a servo hooked up. Um, and remember, all of these are analogous to what the physical devices look like. Um, you know, sometimes you'll be presented with maybe like a different connector. If you see on this little servo, there's a, oh, I can actually, can I do it this way? If I were to look on this servo, I'd see this little connector, right? Those are just pins. Um, if you can find a way to hook a wire up to them. Oh, wait. You can't see that, obviously. Uh, so those are pins on my little stepper motor. You can figure out how to get a wire attached to them. You don't have to have the right connector as long as you can get it attached, but life's easier when you do. So um, I've hooked this up. I'm gonna go over to the code and we want to do something. So what libraries are there? Do they have a servo library? Yes, they do. Um, so the servo library is one of the standard super common ones that ships with Arduino, so they were nice enough to have it here. Um, you'll notice at the top, I did pound include servo.h. It's just like including a library in uh, 
and C or C++ or some other languages that use very similar syntax. Um, this is a pre-compiler directive that set, tells the linker to find a bunch of code that's in this file and dump it here. Um, so I could go open up that servo.h file and dump all the info here, um, but instead I'm, you know, it, I'm using, I'm not reinventing the wheel. I don't want to uh, reuse code that I haven't done. Um, and I'm going to show you the Arduino CC reference here, uh, servo h Arduino. Um, because Arduino's, uh, do, 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 do. Arduino's uh, are typically, the most of the uh, prototyping with an Arduino realistically starts with somebody, so you start with sample code, right? I Anytime I get a new sensor, I start with sample code. I'll just kind of show you in the Arduino IDE, if I go to file examples, there's a ton of these really simple examples for controlling a lot of really simple things. And I never really bother trying to do something from scratch if there's a sample there that already exists. Uh, because why? Like, why not just tear apart sample code? Um, so this is the one for the servo. Declare a servo, servo, attach it to a pin, do some stuff with it. Right, like, I don't need to reinvent the wheel on this one. So I'm going to copy some of the stuff in. I'm going to say, hey, I need to declare the servo first, uh, which is a class. So servo, my servo. I'm not going to call it my servo. I'm going to call it thing. Why not? Uh, and then I'm going to attach it during the setup. So that would be thing dot attach, uh, and then the pin number that I'm on, and I'm on what pin am I on? I'm on pin number eleven. Cool. So that's all well and good. Now we're all set up, and then down here, I'm I'm gonna just comment out this stuff. because I want it to be here, but I don't want to delete it, but I don't want it to do anything. All right, and so what I'm gonna do is the servo, you can move it to some location in, I think this is a, is this a 180 degree servo? Let's close code and go back to servo. Tell me, it doesn't tell me. I think this is a 180 degree servo. So I'm gonna be able to control it between zero and 1028. Um, however, the uh, the sir, the analog, the uh, potentiometer is reading between zero and 1024, right? So I need to do some mapping. If I have a fraction, I'm gonna have X over 1024, and I need to map that into Y over 180, right? Cross multiplying, that will be uh, X times 180 divided by 1024. Uh, it gives me my Y value, right? Uh, and so I need to perform that operation on this. Um, because I might end up with decimals here, um, I'm not going to use an integer. I'm going to cast it to an integer later. So I'm going to make it a float, a floating point number. Uh, even though analog read is going to spit out an integer, I'm going to treat it like a float. And then what I'm going to do is uh, write that, send the servo there. Um, so that would be thing dot write. Um, value times 180 divided by 1024 and cast that to an int. Cool. So I'm going to dump this uh, into thing.write. I don't want another servo. 
Why are you giving me another servo? There we go. Okay, cool. So let's see if I got this right and this works. I have some errors. Do I have mismatched delimiters? Maybe, I don't know. What is it complaining about? Okay, so this closes that. Ah, oh, yes, I have one too many. So notice I can move the knob and the servo moves to a position. So now I can control something with this knob. And what this thing is hooked up to, I don't know. Like, that's your problem. Um, you know, you, you SSC has 3D printers. Uh, if you can't get to them on site, sorry. You can CAD something up. Um, but, uh, oh, I don't have the chat open. I'm sorry. Anyway, so yeah, now I am controlling a servo with this, right? Same, same input, just mapping it to a different output. And really, this is very little code. I don't actually, I'm not using these LEDs. I'm just doing a little bit of math here. Um, now there is, just to throw that out there, there is also a function built into Arduino for doing this kind of thing. Um, that's super more efficient. Um, and it's the map function. Uh, my enter key not working? Oh, I have to stop, right, sorry, I forget that. All right, stop simulation. So what I can do is map two values to each other. Um, instead, what I could say is, I'll go int float int new val equals map the input, uh, the input low range, which is zero, the input high range, which is 1,024. Um, I think it might be 1,023, but whatever. Um, zero and then 180 because that's what I want the output to be. Um, and that's a way to map an input variable to an output variable. It's, it's fancy cross multiplying optimized for computers. Um, so yeah, that exists. I just, I don't know, I've never been in a habit of using it until I really need to. Um, cool. Actually, I'll leave that there, I'll just, uh, comment it out. Um, and if you, if everyone would like, um, afterwards, I'll send over to Kimiko the, uh, uh, this giant code file. I'll share a link to this project and uh, I don't know, whatever else I can think of. I'll just send over a pile of here's things we did. Oh, and the presentation, that was the other thing. Um, so yeah, that's controlling a servo. Um, and so now I have used electronics to control something very physical, right? Um, which is really cool. Um, so going from here, uh, if anybody, you know, if nobody has any specific projects that they're trying to work on, um, let's see, what is, oh, hey, in this presentation, I totally forgot that I have this. Uh, here's kind of the gist of the breakdown of what's going on with a potentiometer internally. Um, feel free to reference that. Um, it's the ultrasonic range finder. That's a cool one. Uh, movement, use that to control it. GPIO expansion. So here's one that I usually I like to share um, to those of you who kind of understand what these circuit things are a little bit better. Um, I don't want to sit here and build it because it's a lot, um, but I'll show you where it all is. So let's... Uh, Go back to my projects. So 
So let's let's say I want to control a bunch of LEDs, like a lot of them. Uh, there's a couple things that go into this question. Um, one is when we were doing the LEDs before, right? We hooked each one of these up to its own GPIO. So that means we needed one pin for each LED. Well, how many pins do we have in Arduino? We have 13 digital. So that means we only get 13 LEDs. No, that's not the case. That just means you've got to think a little bit more cleverly or cleverer. Uh, you've got to expand that number of pins. You've got to use what you know about information to make that more. Um, what you can think about is uh, your monitor, like if you were thinking of your computer monitor, like a bajillion LEDs, if this is a 1024 by 768, that means you get 1024 by 768 by three for each color, and that's how many like little LEDs you're controlling in theory. Um, so what, are you gonna have that many pins going into the processor or your graphics card to do that? No, you think of some scheme for making it work better. Um, so here is one. There are many options, but here is one. This is a little IC, little chip, called the 74HC595. And that's a number, and you're like, what is that? That's just a number. It's a shift register. So 74HC595. Uh, the problem with showing pictures of ICs is that they all look the same. They all look like little black dark gray rectangles with pins sticking off the side of them. Um, so if somebody shows you a little IC and you can't see the number, you have no idea what they do. Um, but it's a shift register. Um, so you can think of it like uh, have a toilet paper tube. Here, we'll draw this. Don't save. I got a toilet paper tube. Here is my toilet paper tube. And I need to, I'm gonna, this is the input, this is the output. And at the bottom of the toilet paper tube, I have a bunch of little buttons. Here's one, here's another, here's another, here's another, whatever, you get the idea, there's more of them here. All right, and then on this side of the toilet paper tube, I've got some ping pong balls. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, actually make that smaller so I can grab it later, uh, or marbles or whatever, we'll call it whatever we want. I'm going to push them in this way. So I push a ping pong ball in. Now that ball will weigh down on this switch and it will turn the switch on. The rest of these all are, are all off. So now let's say I add another ping pong ball. Why, why can't I copy and paste the ping pong ball? What has happened to Microsoft Paint that I can no longer copy and paste? All right, anyway. Uh, so if I wanted to add another ping pong ball and I shoved that in the end of the tube, it would push this one down and then this one would come in. And now these two would be depressed. Now let's say I wanted to leave a space. Uh, so I put in a, I don't know, some bar, whatever thing that I, I'm gonna put in this. I put that in next and it pushes everything else down, but it doesn't depress the button. So now I get one, one, zero. Pressed, pressed, not pressed. That's kind of what a shift register is. I don't know if that made any sense, but it kind of made sense to me. Um, that's what a shift register is. It has, this is an eight bit shift register. So it, it's kind of like a register. It holds eight bits, so one byte of information. And it has an input, um, 74HC595 uh, data sheet. So it's a bunch of little flip-flops that I shoved out into, and then I can read them out in parallel. It's called a serial in parallel out shift register um, because you pipe data in serially, like in a line, like you're type, tapping data into it, 
and then you can view it all out at the same time. So what that means is, for me, is that I can use, I need a clock. Uh, let's go open the cloud. I need really just three pins. And in some shift registers, I don't even need the latch. But two to three pins, clock, data, and latch to control eight outputs. I can tell each one of these to be high or low by tapping data into here. So in this example, I have it counting up in binary from 0 to 255 um, by typing data in here. And so I can go through this code and explain what's going on. At the beginning, I am setting up, or actually, let's, let's start with the, the actual shift register. So you'll notice these turquoise wires, and each one is one different LED. Each one of those is connected to one of the inputs from the, or sorry, one of the outputs from the shift register. So the zeroth output, the most significant bit, or the, sorry, the least significant, the, least significant, the most significant bit, yeah, is, uh, is this one right here. That's my zero. And then one, two, three, four, five, six over here. Uh, seven for all of the bits, all right? And then I have a couple things, like this is a clear, which is if you wanted to asynchronously clear all the values that are in there. I'm not worrying about that, so I j it's active low, so I just tie it to positive voltage. Um, this one is the output enable. I want it to always be enabled, so I'm just tying it low. And then this one is power, and this one is ground. So there's not much going on up here. Uh, it just looks like a lot because I have a lot of wires. And then I have these three here. I have the clock. I have the, sorry, the register clock, the output register clock, which is the like the latch, um, and then I have the uh, the input, the data pin, where I tap data into it. Um, so what I'm going to do in my code is, uh, do, 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 do. right here I'm doing it using shift out, which is a built-in function, but I could do this by manually you know, raising the toggles, toggling the pins high and low, um, but use the libraries if they're there. So what I'm doing is first setting the pin mode for each of the three control pins that I need to output. Then I'm starting a for loop. If you're familiar with uh, C or C++, then you probably know what a for loop is for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, we start from zero, this is the initial condition. This is the termination condition. And this is what to do at the end of each loop, each iteration. So my iterator, I'm setting up as I. I'm saying start I at zero. Keep doing this until I is, so this is no longer true. So effectively I is, how do I tell him it's six? Uh, oh, it's six. I thought we went to 630. Sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry, Niall. <laughs> that's okay, fine. Um, ship sorry, register. Sorry disappeared. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, hey, there's still two here. They're the cool people. Um, there are three. Three. So yeah, the cool people are here. <laughs> so it's counting in binary. Uh, and you can look at this code and figure out what's going on. Um, but yeah. And um, feel free to share my email. It's nile at hackerlab.org. Um, if you have any questions about some particular, like, Arduino project, um, maybe if you, when you put this up to YouTube, edit out that part. Um, so actually, you know what? No, my email is publicly available. Uh, Niall at sorry hackerlab.org. Um, would you like me to share it in the competition packet for Startup Week? Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, if anybody's got any hardware or Arduino questions, feel free to contact me. Just let them, if they can, let me know who they are. So not like this is a random, you know, person. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, well, I, I've lost. I've I've stopped trying to assume that people will format emails in any particular point or format. But anyway, uh, and I'll share all of this information um, with Kimiko, and I'm hoping you can get that out to the people here. But yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. When we update, well, when we upload the YouTube channel, which will be this weekend, we can add the okay. files in like the description. So cool. cool along cool, cool. with the Hacker Lab blurb. So sweet. Thank you. All right. Well, I hope you all enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, Niall, do you mind staying afterwards? Sure. Cool. Yeah, thank you for doing that. We really appreciate it. We're probably going to get more views.
during the week itself. It's just how um, <laughs> technical workshops have been pretty difficult. Yeah, yeah. That's our thing too. We've actually, if anybody is open to it, we've got a ton of uh, free uh, workshops, a lot of them with a business or marketing focus going on on our site. Um, I'd say shameless plug hackerlab.org slash online. So everything from uh, meditation to uh, website basics, like really simple how to set up a website. We're doing a SQL and databases class that might be useful for some folks. Uh, uh, Fusion 360 for CAD and modeling, um, some marketing and business dev stuff, uh, legal patents and trademarkings going on in a couple of weeks too. So uh, feel free to check that out. Uh, financial management. Yeah. They're all, most of them are free to non-members. A couple of them are costing money. I think the SQL one. Um, but if anybody from this really wants to get into one that costs money, feel free to just shoot me an email. I'll, I'll happily let you in um, if you can't afford it. So, but most of them are free. Uh, it's just that one it looks like. So anyway, yeah, that's my piece. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Niall. And it's in the video too, so people will know. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So with that, yeah, thanks for everyone that came and I will